Hi, Johnny Cube here for eLove. eLove is an innovative product that makes expressing love easy for you. Is it difficult to make that phone call sometimes? Is it difficult to meet face to face and express a Christian type of love? Well, with eLove, it's easy. All you have to do is log in, click, and you've sent your love to somebody special. And you didn't have to meet them face to face. So dial 1-800-YOU-NEED-IT and tell them Johnny sent you. Yep, it's just that easy. Hello, welcome to church. You guys seemed kind of punchy earlier and now you're stuck with me. It's God's punishment on you. Um, uh, Glad you're here. If you're visiting with us this weekend, see, they're punchy. They're punchy. Uh, If you're visiting here with us this weekend, uh, glad to have you. This is High Desert Church. We love the Lord. We love what He does in the lives of people. That's why we got baptisms. That's why we got worship. And that's why we're going to talk about Him and His Word. My name's Tim. I am one of the teaching pastors here. And uh, I'm going to teach you through some stuff today. Uh, Some of the stuff is very straightforward and simple. Um, however, if you are uh, maybe like distracted thinking about the football game, you're TiVoing, uh, we have notes for you that you can like could be jotting things down. So if you want to uh, put your hand in the air, if you don't have notes, we'll give them to you and then that way you can track along with us. Good luck tracking along with me. There's no rhyme or reason to my thought process. Um, we're going to work through most of chapter four today and, and just a little blip of chapter five as well. Uh, continuing our series on easy bake faith. Um, I'll read the entire passage for us because I like scripture. Scripture changes lives. Tim Cool does not. And, uh, and then after that, I'll begin. And when I'm finished, I'll stop and you can go home. Verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever doesn't love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we've seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in Him, and He in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in God, excuse me, lives in love, lives in God, and God in Him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we're like him. There's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who doesn't love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he hasn't seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now, I don't know if you missed it, but today it's about love. God calls you to love because God is loving and God has loved you. And though therefore God wants you to love others because other people are loved by God because God is loving. And he's made you to be a loving person who's loved by God to love others. Because those others need to be loved by you because they're loved by God. And since they're loved by God, they should be loved by you because you are currently being loved by God. Because God is loving. Because he is love. And you should be loving. So love people. Uh Uh-huh. Boom. (laughs) It's, it's like, I, I, I mean, I, I get it. He's like, dude, love people because God loves you. But he just spends some time saying it. And, and I, I mean, like for just a cursory, quick little reading, it's almost like the commercials that have been on our TV for a long time. We need to make California better because it's bad. And California needs to get better because things can be better because they're bad. And I'm not going to do bad things. The other person will do bad things and won't make California better. But I'm not going to do bad things. I'm going to do better things. Because California needs to be better. <laughs> okay, thank you, both parties. <laughs> I, <laughs> thank you for letting me know that. Because I've been fooled. I think all of my friends who are hurting, I have, things are fine in California. Good Lord. Now, I am not saying that Scripture is like politicians' ad. 
because scripture is not like that. But it's almost kind of like, okay, so like I'm going to come to church today and you're going to tell me that love is good. Yay, I kind of knew that. So the point of today is going to try and be to discover what about this passage presses on our lives? What about this passage calls us to live more Christ-like? What about this passage points to Jesus? And we're going to do a few things to accomplish that today. And uh, one of them includes a fantastic chart. Oh, Tom's charts are so awesome. Mine is so different than that. Here's the first thing I want you to write down. I want you to write down that we are called to love by his example. I want to read one of the verses in particular. And uh, and we're going to talk about it because it presses on us. Verse 9 says that this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Now that sounds very bible it sounds very familiar, it sounds very like no duh. And the reason we called the series Easy Bake Faith because most of the things John tells us are kind of no duh things. But I think most of us struggle with the things he calls us to. I mean the world isn't a very gracious, loving place. You probably have gotten in an argument with your spouse or your kids in the last six days. I do not know. We do not have cameras. But we know. (laughs) Because we have wives and kids as well. And we've also gotten in fights. You've probably gotten fairly frustrated in traffic this week. I don't know that. But you probably have. You've probably thought bad thoughts about the car in front of you. And the cars behind you. Three accidents this week on Apple Valley Road in the morning. Well, no. One was Wednesday evening. Whatever. Never mind. People, the speed limit on Apple Valley Road is not 35, it's 55. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Heart in check. <laughs> I need to read the chapter one more time. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> Love. Yeah, your, your world has not been a loving place this week, and God is calling you to be an agent of change in it. And so God says, hey, here, let me explain it real simple. Here's what I've done. I've demonstrated my love towards you, and there have been three things that I've done. There was an act, there was a cost, and there was a result. And the act is that I sent, and the cost, what it cost me to get you, it was my son Jesus. Now, God has all strength and knows all things, and so like it would be easy for us to think, well, it's easy for God to buy things. He could go to Macy's and buy things that aren't on sale. He can go to the car lot and buy the, the car with the options. He can go on the housing list and not look through foreclosures. God can do all of these things, but there's one thing that he has that it was like valuable above all else. There's one thing that God the Father had that was unique that just couldn't just be frivolously spent. And that was the life of his son. Now, I don't, I mean, well, okay. As an American, I am, I understand, I am more well-off than most of the world. And I have a fine job, and I've been really fortunate to have a job for this economy, and my heart goes out to people who are looking for work. But, I mean, my wife and I, we don't have a ton of nice things, and that's fine. But we've been doing the Ramsey thing, you know, and we have an envelope because, okay, my wife is the man. <laughs> she, she ripped, she, she is, and she's cute too. And the only reason I say that is I don't know if I'm allowed to say she's hot in church. So, um, Tom's not here. It's all okay. And, uh, and so she pulled cabinets off of a wall in the kitchen, removed the wall from the kitchen. So it opened up the, you know, the house a little bit more drywalled the ceiling. I could, whatever. She's, I'm t- mm. So, <laughs> builds an island in the kitchen from these cabinets, okay? I come home and I'm like, we have an island. No man is an island, but I own one. And, th- but ch- what she didn't have, I know that was bad. Thank you for not acknowledging it. Um, what she did not have was a countertop. So we've had plywood pieces, not even one continuous plywood piece, uh, on our countertop for months, months. And we have our little granite envelope. Well, the envelope is paper, but it's for granite. And, uh, we have our envelope that we've been putting our dollars in um, for a few months, quite a few months, and we needed about 500 bucks to buy one solid piece of stone. And we did that last week. I went to the, I went to the stone cellar guy, and I was like, I would like a nine foot long piece of rock, please. And he's like, okay, it's such and such amount of dollars. And I'm like, I have such and such amount of dollars. Dave Ramsey has said to show you the money, and you'd fold in front of me. And... 
And so we pay for it, and, and I'm excited, and he said, okay, here's, here's what I'm going to do. Because you're just buying a rock, you're not getting installation or nothing cut out or nothing like that. You just want a giant piece of rock. Yes, I do. Can you have it flat? Yes, I can. I'm just going to show up in your driveway with a 9 by 4 piece of granite, and you're going to have to get it into your house. And I'm like, I got this. And he said, you should have some friends with you. And I'm like, all my friends work at a church. Like... I don't know if those are the kind of friends you want helping you move. They, I got a lot of them. And we, we showed up, and it's on the truck, and I'm thinking, oh, sweet Jesus, that is a big, big piece of rock. <laughs> and and uh, one of my friends, fortunately, is a general contractor, and, he's, and I said, so is this going to be okay, us moving this in the house? And he said, it's fine, as long as, long as there doesn't wind up like being any bowing in the rock, because even though granite is really strong, that much weight, if it bows a little bit, it's just going to snap right in the middle. And I thought, oh, no, my wife will not like a snapped piece of rock. <laughs> My wife wants one rock in the kitchen. And, and so we carried it in very carefully and we tilted it down very carefully. And oh, I have a giant piece of rock in my kitchen now. It's very nice. It is the nicest thing I own. It is, it's, it's nicer than my car. And so, and, and, and if, 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 if like for some reason, you know, something needed to happen in my family, like we weren't gonna make mortgage one month or something. And like the option was, well, we could sell our piece of granite. I'd be like, oh no. It's absolute black. I don't know. God only had one thing of value, and it was of eternal value. I mean, that was it. It was everything. And, and here's the funny thing in my fantastically impressive chart. The action was sending. The cost was Jesus. Here's the part that really gets me. What he got out of the deal was you. And I don't mean to be mean, but you might not be worth. I mean, it's just, here's, I'm, I know, it's awkward now. <laughs> I, well, I'll talk about me. I tend to be apathetic. I tend to be selfish. I tend to be angry. I tend to be self-involved. I tend to be stubborn. I tend to be like standoffish. And when you think about what he spent and what he got. Part of me's thinking he got ripped, man. You know? Because this is the result of that act of love was my redemption. And we talk about it, and you know, redemption is such a wonderful thing in church, but if you stop and think about it, what he redeemed was a broken, angry, selfish, bitter, resentful piece of human that he says, I know, but I see, I see my image in you, and I redeem you back to myself. And it's this now that flips over because the scripture goes on to say, just because, oh, just don't paraphrase it, just read it, okay. This is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, HDC, since God loved us in this way, we also ought to love one another. And I think America is a, like well-versed with these first two concepts. Thank you, I'm sorry, I did it again, go back, I'm so sorry, it's my fault. Boop, boop, backwards. There we go. We're well aware that love costs an action. Like we need to be forgiving or merciful or gracious or something like that. We get that. That's a no duh. We get that there's a cost. I know that. There's time and emotion and effort that goes into me loving. What I think Christians get hung up on is there are certain people in life that we don't want to see them redeemed. If you have an ex-spouse, you think that they've chosen the life they're in and for heaven's sake they can live in it. If your grown kids have not been grateful of the two decades of life that you've poured into them and they've gone off and they're making their own stupid decisions, at some point your heart gets protective and you think, you know what, forget them. Let them make their own mistakes. They're the boss at work that is a jerk and you know, forget them. They don't deserve it. This is where we get hung up. We don't want people to feel redeemed in a situation. If they have wronged you, if they are, if they are like the people that you need to be loving towards, we don't want to see that happen. Because it feels like we have more common sense than God does. God, why would I extend grace, mercy, effort, time, emotion on someone? And then this is what I wind up with. I wind up with them. I don't want them. I, I, it's like, if, put it in monetary terms. God redeems you rather than with the blood of his son with a billion dollars. And he just, he just pours it over you. And he says, now I've redeemed you out of these riches. Now go with these riches and go be redemptive to other people. Well, rather than going and hanging out with homeless people that smell like urine, you would probably go find other billionaires. And you would be gracious with them and give them things because they can give things back to you. 
And God says, no, that's not the manner I loved you in. I loved you while you smelled like a homeless person. I I loved you when you were worthless. I loved you when you had no value. And so the call this morning from Scripture isn't just a simple like, hey, God is love and go love people. It's, well, Jesus tells three stories. Jesus is hanging out one day, and he's hanging out with people that have like deadbeat dads that don't pay their child support. He's hanging out with cheating spouses that are like jerks. He's hanging out with people that avoid their taxes, and, and, they, and they like cheat people. And, and this, this group of religious people, the good people, you know, the Christians who bomb abortion clinics, they're looking in on this situation, and, and they ask him, Jesus, why are you hanging out with sinners? Now, the word sinner in our culture doesn't have a lot of punch. It's kind of almost a comical word. It, had, it was a put down. It would be like, why are you hanging out with perverts? Why are you hanging out with cheaters? Why are you hanging out with deadbeat dads? And rather than explain love to them in, in like a phrase, he says, let me tell you three stories. First story is about a guy who has a lot of sheep and he loses one and he freaks out until he finds it. And then when he finds the sheep, he's so pumped. Jesus says, that's like, that's like what God is like when someone comes back to him. And they're listening and they're like, well, that story makes sense. Because in the same way, if you're a business owner and you have a landscaping business and you've got 10 trucks around this desert and every day you send them out and when you send them out, they all check in, boop, boop, on their next tell, boop, boop, hey, I'm going out to Apple Valley, boop, boop, I'm going to Tim Cool's house, it's bad, boop, boop, I'm going, you know, wherever. They all check in with you and you get nine boop, boops that morning and you don't get the 10th. And as a business owner, you know that that truck costs you money and makes you money. And so you're very interested in where this truck is. And so you're boop booping, you're boop boop, you're boop boop, and there's no boop boop back. And now you're now you're frustrated, and so now you're starting to wonder, well, where's the truck? So you check in with your other trucks, they don't know where he is. You hop on the email, you email him, and you don't know where he is. And after lunch, you, you start driving around and you don't know where he is. End of the day, four o'clock in the afternoon, boop boop. There comes the next tell, beep beep. And it's from the 10th truck. And he says, hey, you know, I needed to get out to a job out in Lucerne. There isn't really good cell coverage out there. I have T-Mobile. And so, you know, I, I was, I needed to get there early. Yeah, it was. I said it. Um, I needed to get there early so I could finish the job and then be back on time, you know, to be back home. Dude, as a business owner, you're feeling a lot better. You're feeling like, whew, because that truck equals money, doesn't it? And the people listening to Jesus' story, they're like, okay, it makes sense. When you tell like a story where someone loses a sheep and get it back, that makes sense. The sheep is valuable. Jesus, well, let me tell you another story. There's this lady, and she has 10 silver coins. 10 silver coins in our um, economy doesn't sound exciting because at the best it's like 10 bucks. Let me say it this way. There's a lady, and it's late November, and it's time to do some Christmas shopping, and she has $1,000 bills. And she gets to shop, and she gets to take care of her kids, and she gets to shop. I mean, best case scenario. And she has cash to do it, not even a swipey. So she, she's got her $1,000 bills all laid out, you know, in her dresser somewhere. I don't know where ladies keep their money. And um, she, she goes to pull it out because it, Tim mentioned Christmas shopping, and she's like, that's it. I get to go now. And uh, she pulls them out, and she's laying them, and she's counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ah, nine? Normally having $900 is a good thing. When you used to have 1000 900 is no longer good. <laughs> and so she freaks out. And she goes and, you know, gently asks the kids in a way only a mother can, where's my $100? <laughs> and the kids are like, I don't got no $100. And she thinks through it. And there has not been like an amazing surplus of candy or video games into the house. So she thinks, ah, they probably don't actually have my $100. She goes to her husband who is currently watching football. And she says, um, where's my $100? And he's like, what? And, like, that's even less of a response than normally she gets from him. So she's fairly, con- like, she's fairly convinced he doesn't have it either. And so she has kids go stand in the driveway. Honey, go get something to eat. All of you leave this house. I am finding my $100. And she looks, and she looks, and she looks, and she looks, and she looks. And, oh, there it is. She found her $100. It was in the bottom of the dryer. And she's like, I found you $100. I found you. Jesus says that's the sort of excitement God has when someone, it, it like, comes to him. Like these people that I'm sitting around and like, Jesus, that story makes sense to us. $100 has value. And he's like, yeah, you're right. You know what? Let me set it up this way. I- I've kind of tricked you. I've loaded you because you think right now the only people that should be loved are lovable people. Let me tell you a third story. And that is when the story of the prodigal son is told. It's a story about a son who tells his dad, dad, give me all the money that I'm, I'm due when you're dead. And I want to have it now. And, and I want to get out of the desert. I'm so tired of the desert. I want to go someplace nice like Rancho Cucamonga. <laughs> and so his dad gives him all the money. 
and the son just goes down the hill and he doesn't want to buy a car because, you know, Toyotas accelerate on their own. The American car market is up and down. He's like, I don't feel secure buying any of these cars. I've got a better idea. I will rent a car. And so he just has a permanent rental. And, and he's just wasting his money on that. He's a young man, and he really wants to impress women. And so he goes clubbing. And when you spend money at clubs, that apparently impresses women. And those are definitely the women you want to wind up with, too. And so he's <laughs> wasting money in abandoned airport hangars down in Ontario. Like, just living the life, man. It's awesome. He winds up pouring through his money. He's, he's like at the bitter end. And so he winds up going a little further south to Norco to work on, on one of the farms. And, like, <laughs> and he, it's there that he runs out of money. And he smells like cow manure. He's, you know dozens of miles from home, and he thinks to himself, you know what, I've screwed things up pretty bad. I need to get back on a Greyhound bus and get up to the desert and just ask my dad for a job. And he comes back up the hill, and he's walking onto his dad's property out in Oak Hills, and the Bible says, Jesus says in this story, that the dad is waiting on his porch, looking across his property, waiting for his son to come home. And Jesus tells the first two stories quickly. They're short. This story in scripture is long, and, and it really revolves around the, the emotion the father has towards the son. And what's fascinating about the third story is he goes out of his way to explain that the son had lost his value. He had become worthless. And so you want to know why I hang out with perverts? You want to know why I hang out with deadbeat dads? Because God intentionally loves things who have lost their worth. And so the first thing that we'll write down about this point is that we are called to give things value again. Love has to be more than a bunch of billionaires hanging out with each other. You're called to bring redemption into situations, and it's probably a person you don't want to find redemption. And I don't mean that you actually literally give the righteousness of Jesus to a person in a situation. That is God's work, not mine. It doesn't matter how redemptively loving I am in a situation, they still have to be right with God. However, God has called some of you guys to people that you're avoiding. You probably have a hit list. Mine is four people long that I do not love. And I will not name them and neither are you allowed to. But you need to reconcile in your mind, will you continually hold love from them? Because you're not being Christ-like. And as a matter of fact, the passage goes on and says things worse than that. Verse 13 says, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges Jesus, the son of God, God lives in him and they live in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God also calls you to love in his strength is your next blank. God calls you to love in his strength. We know and rely on the love God has for us. The ironic thing is the people in your life that God wants you to love are the people in your life you do not want to love. And so what do you do about that? Um, just a quick refresher, because not everyone in the church has been here for the last couple of years. Um, but my wife and I uh, have two wonderful boys, and we were adopting a baby girl a couple of years ago. It's been over two years now. And we had her for a year, and we loved her. I mean, she came into the home, and I mean, she was five, seven, five months old, and just, I mean, it's so easy to love a baby, you know, and she was with us for a year, and at the end of the year, the state took her back and put her back with her mom, because her mom had gotten back on track, and it broke our hearts, and for a year, we went with no, you know, updates, pictures, communication, and that's okay, I mean, you know, her mom got back on track, and that was that, and in October, it was the one-year anniversary, and it was, uh, it was a, you know, weird weekend for Wendy and I. Um, and uh, two weeks after the one-year anniversary, my wife gets a text message from Alyssa's mom saying, hey, you know, my schedule's kind of leveled out. We have some time. Would you like to come visit us this Sunday? That was on a Thursday. And I got home, and my wife said, hey, you know, Alyssa's mom wants us to come visit. And I would love to say that my heart just instantly responded with, you know, Jesus loves her and so we're going to go visit her too but the first thing that popped into my mind is my daughter's not going to remember me she won't know who I am and I don't know if I want to go into an apartment that I might see problems that I can't fix I don't know if I can drive and visit for an hour and then just leave again 
And so I went to bed that night and my head was spinning. My wife, my wife is wired differently than I am. She is loyal to the end. I mean, she's the toys in Toy Story holding hands as they go down to the fire, you know, like, <laughs> it's a good scene. And she looked at me and she could tell I was struggling. She knows I don't like situations I'm not in control of. <laughs> And, uh, and she looked at me, and she's just, she, she's smart. She said, we're going to do right, right? And I'm like, oh, you're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> and I go to bed that night, and I was nervous. And we had to tell her on Friday if we were going to make it on Sunday. And I woke up, and, uh, you know, I'm like, tell her we'll be there. <laughs> And Sunday I came to church, and, you know, I wanted church to go for a long time because I was nervous to leave and go visit. And we leave, and guys, I'm not making this part up. I ran three errands between church and there. One of my errands was I stopped and bought potato chips because I said I was hungry. It was a lie. <laughs> I was nervous. And we go in, and we visited for an hour and a half, and she's doing well, and mom's doing all right. And it was, man, I, you know, the daddy in me was just like, that was hard. And we leave, and I was up till 1.30 that Sunday night just spinning, 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 spinning. And I was praying, 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 praying. And God said, Tim, I need you to love her. And I said, I know, God, I do. And he said, no, 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 not Alyssa, her mom. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Alyssa is finding the lost sheep, the lost $100. It's easy to love a baby. It's hard to love the mama. Two days later, she sent Wendy a text and said, hey, we really enjoyed the visit. You guys are welcome to come every month if you want. And I'm like, oh, Oh, diarrhea every month. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to say that either. <laughs> you know, but I'll say this. I'll say this. That it took me a year, a year to get to the point where I'd even be willing to struggle with this. And really, I mean, this passage says... You know, his spirit lives in you. We know and rely on the love God calls us. I want you to leave today semi-frustrated with the message. I want you to leave feeling like a call to love cannot just be all of us always agreeing that we'll be kind to the people that are kind to us. That's not Christ-like love. But I will admit this to you, that loving people might mean that you need to spend more time sitting in front of God's love for you each week, either in reading or prayer or worship or something. Listen to podcasts, find someone better than me to listen to, but you need to continually remind yourself that, God, you've called me to this and you've equipped me for this, and I am called to live like your son, redemptively. So the people I will love, admittedly, are not lovely. That's the deal. That's what's going on. You're called to love in his strength, and it's there for you. And we will see what God will continue to do on that. There's actually even a lot more to this story than I'll talk about today because, well, there's more going on. The passage goes on, though, and it gets challenging. It gets punchy like you. It gets, <laughs> verse 19, there's another call as well. And it basically goes on to say, you don't love God if you... 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Well, that's frustrating. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. Whoever claims to love God yet steals from babies is a liar. Whoever claims to love God yet ah, hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever doesn't love their brother and sister whom you have seen, you cannot love God whom you haven't seen. And he's given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother or sister. I would love to tell you guys this morning that love is something God encourages, that he's proud of, that he's excited about. It's something he demands. You don't love God if you don't love others. Write that down. And be as uncomfortable with it as I am. I mean, I'm not better than you. And it's not, you know, like, oh, the pastor's on stage telling us all how bad we are. No, I'm in there too. And it's difficult. Um, I went to men's retreat a couple weekends ago. Was it last weekend? I don't know when it was. I, I don't remember what today is. Um, 
and it was a ton of fun. Uh, I don't know why we don't all go more often. Uh, we got to eat food, hang out with dudes, and listen to good teaching. And then in the afternoon, we played football forever. And all of us were bad together. It was great. But we all pretended like the glory days, like, man, I, man, I, I used to be able to pull that off. No, nah, none of us did. Okay, so going to men's retreat. I was heading um, east across Bear Valley Road real early in the morning to get up to the mountains. And... Um, Actually, to pick someone up. Jeremy, Pete, and I were heading out. He's our new high school guy. Such a good guy. Hired him from Hume Lake. Oh, good import. Um, early in the morning, not so early that the sun was high enough up that my flip-down visor could block it, but not, it was not so low that the dirt was blocking it. It was right in the worst spot, right in the spot where you're like, okay, I could go blind or I could drive blind. One or the other. Like, those are my options. So I'm driving down and I'm doing the whole like, well, I could probably sense the cars through my hand. So I'm like blocking the sun, but you can't see the road either. And in your notes is an amazing graphical presentation of this biblical concept. Here's what I want you to try and do. And some of you are spiteful and you're going to say that you can and you can't. Don't lie in church. But I want you to somehow block out the word others and still see God on that paper. Like hold your, I mean, it's like, you know, if you say you can, I'm telling you, you're lying right now. When you block one, you block the other. And God says in his word, you can see people. You can't see me. So love the people, and you're loving me. But you have people on your not-to-love list. I know you do because I do too. And there's someone in your life, that, whether it's been recent or a long time standing, you've decided to block them. And God says, stop. That's not Christ-like. You cannot say you love me and intentionally block them out. Now, I struggle with it, and there's other passages that balance us out. I, I, but you know what? Sometimes I think we just need to say what Scripture says. And I don't need to soften the call this morning. First Peter. Peter's writing, and he says, Husbands, if you're not being compassionate with your wives, don't go praying. Because God doesn't want to listen to you until you're being loving with your wife. Well, that's challenging. Jesus says, you're on your way to temple and you're bringing your sacrifice because that's how you worshiped back in the day. And so you're bringing a gift to God to tell God how much you love him and you remember that a brother or sister has something between you, stop, go back, make it right with them first, then go worship God. Let me tell you that if you are bringing me a present, you are bringing me Chargers tickets, hopefully not to a Raiders game because apparently they're better than us right now. What? No, don't woo. Come. I know, you're allowed. It's... I don't know what's happening. The world is ending soon. Get right with Jesus. <laughs> I know. I'll admit it. I'll admit it. You're bringing me a present, and you remember you and your wife had a fight? Bring me the present, and then go back. <laughs> like, finish your errand first. Stay on task, man. Stay on task. God says stay off task. Go love someone first, and then come back and worship me. That's a selfless God. I mean, that is a God who is not self-obsessed with who he is. If he's saying prioritize your relationships here first, because listen, it's harder for you to love people around you than it is for you to say you love me. Matter of fact, I would write this down. Turning up the volume on your declared love for God while neglecting people around you deafens your own ear to your self-deception. And so you got to love other people. Because scripture says you don't love God if you don't love others. Chapter 5 actually goes on, and we're going to finish. Well, we're going to work on being finished. With chapter 5 says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God. Keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. America is vaguely familiar with Christianity. And they see things like, well, Christians are dumb to be judgmental because the Bible says don't judge. And so I don't have to actually love Jesus to go to heaven because Christians are narrow-minded about that. There are hateful, angry, bitter Christians in our country who burn Korans and bomb abortion clinics. And that does not communicate God's love. However, 
I need to graciously say what the scripture says. And it says, everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Who overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And our church wants to be clear that you don't love God if you don't love Jesus. And I don't say that with an air of superiority. I do not say that with like angry dogmatism. I say that with a humble submission to what the Bible says. And let me explain it this way, though. If you think it's unfair and it's not right for God to say, well, why should I have to specifically love Jesus? Let's say that you enjoyed church this weekend, and you're like, hey, you know, that Tim guy's a weirdo. I feel better about myself because of him. And so we had dinner together, and you're like, let me see this, you know, countertop of yours. You come, we have dinner, you meet my wife, my family, my kids, and then we wind up making up for, meeting up for lunch afterwards. And you say, you know, Tim, I really like you, but man, your wife, oh, she's such a hag. I'd punch you in the throat in the name of Jesus. <laughs> because my wife is my other half. If you say, Tim, you're awesome. Your kids are twerps. Oh, my gosh. Get them out of your house. I, we'd have issues. And it is strange to me, it is strange to me that people can say and acknowledge in American culture that me and God are cool. Nah, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I'm not angry about it. But let me be clear. The Bible says, no, you do not love God. You don't love the Father if you don't love His Son. And it doesn't make sense to me, and I understand that I'm jaded and I'm on the other side, but it doesn't make sense to me that you wouldn't acknowledge that Jesus is a loving Savior. Yes, He wants your life because He wants to make it better. And not just, it, but He wants to redeem it. He wants to give you complete love. He is the picture of the Father waiting for a worthless son to come back from his life and to say, you know what, I need my dad more than I need me. I don't understand why you wouldn't want that. And then he will call you to something. He will call you to love others. And I know that's difficult. But you do not love God if you do not love Jesus. And Jesus has loved you. That's how God shows his love. Well, I don't know how Christians can think that there's a loving God with war and murder and rape in this world. God is well aware of those things. That's why he's loved us through his son. His son stepped into that mess to save you from that mess. Don't write it off that God's behind the mess. We know who's behind that. That's us. Because we're not loving. And so I just want to say that immature Christians attack those kind of people from inside church walls. While our call to maturity here at HDC is to lovingly lead them to love himself. And it's easy for us to like leave church and be like, oh, those stupid non-Christians. Oh, you're such a liar. If you say you love God and you don't do enough. You need to love others because God loved you, because God loves them, because God is loving, and you've been loved, and you should be loving because you, they need to be loved. And that's how we need to handle it. And Christians, we also, I think our church isn't really the, actually the angry, hateful, spiteful Christians, but I think a lot of times we're like the quiet, passive ones. They were like, well, all the loud, obnoxious Christians get depressed, and I don't want to speak up. Dude, speak up. You guys are probably a lot more mature than they ever will be. So speak up, HTC. Redeem this valley. Oh, my goodness. You're equipped to do it. Now, the last thing is this, is that it, chapter 2 says, don't love the world. Don't love anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father isn't in them. Everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, man, it comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. I know that in your situations, you probably process like that difficult relationship. Ladies, you probably process your quiet, indifferent husband with your girlfriends. And I know that they're probably protective of you and they might be giving you really bad advice. They might be telling you to move on. That's not Christ-like. Fellas, you might be complaining about your wife to your friends at work and saying she's such an ag and this and that. And they're probably telling you to lay down the law or put her in her place. And you know what? Don't listen to them. Why would you listen to the advice of a world that is obsessed with loving themselves? It's backwards love. It will wind up getting you infected in the same way when a hair grows back in. It infects. You will wind up with an infected heart. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because there's call to love. Love from above. You love redemptively. Christ-like in a way that honors Jesus and gives value to others. We're going to pray. Father, we pray this morning that you would call our church to give value to the world around us. And I do not carry the strength or righteousness or power that Jesus does, but I represent him. And in this world, I'm like him. And so God, my life needs to point to redemption. I need to sit across a room from a single mom who's doing the best she can and tell her that God is loving towards her 
and wants what's best for her. God, I need to sit across from a spouse that's been cold and indifferent for months or years and actively love them. I need to pour value back into them. I need to look at my kids and rather than be disappointed with their failures and letdowns, I need to lead them towards love. I need to give value in this world. Father, I know there are also people here in our church today, in this moment, who have never loved your son, Jesus. And if you're here today and you love the idea of God and you agree with the idea of loving people, but you have always kept Jesus at arm's length, can I be super humble and gracious about this and tell you, you've got to love God's son because God has loved you through his son. As a matter of fact, we want people to acknowledge three things about Jesus here. One is that you admit that you need to be loved by God, that you have sin, that you're broken before him, that you have an infected heart, however you want to describe it, that you'll admit that to him and that you'll believe that Jesus is uniquely qualified to love you because of who he is and what he accomplished and that today you'll choose to follow him. And we want to know that. We want to know that you've given your life to the Lord you can communicate that to us after the service, one of our pastors, on a welcome form. But ultimately, we want our church to honor the Son because the Son has honored us. And so God, call us into our, our world this week. God, specifically put on our hearts, who is it that you're calling us to love? God, equip us to do it and then lift up your name through it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, you are dismissed. Go have a